What is up, my friends? This is the Protect Your Neck Podcast, and I'm your host, Dan Tom. Analyst is work you could find over at MMA Junkie as well as LineMovement.com. But on this year program, the Protect Your Neck Podcast, we break down high-level MMA. That's what we're going to do here today, tonight, whenever you're listening to this. Hopefully, it's before the fight. Recording this just after weigh-ins, morning time, West Coast Pacific time, more specifically Las Vegas time, because it is, it is UFC Vegas 9 for the hashtag UFC on ESPN Plus 34, UFC Fight Night, Overeem Sakai, UFC Fight Night 176 so And we're going to break it down from top to bottom as per usual. Check the timestamps for when the breakdown starts, and if you don't want to listen to this raspy voice that's still somehow holding up, I will be sounding like uh, Miley Cyrus by the end of the year, then skip to the very end of the episode, where I always recap my picks and plays. This will be an expedited episode, I, 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 I feel confident in saying that, as future you can look down and check me to see if I'm wrong on the total time elapsed for this episode, it's going to be a quick one. Um, just a quick question couple shouts and a very, very quick recap at the top. Then we will start the breakdown as why I gave you guys the timestamp warning there. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for joining me and I sip my coffee. Uh, apologies for last week. I had a weak moment. Uh, <laughs> uh yeah, uh, your boy definitely uh, is probably going to need to be taking a break. The Contender Series will be taking a break. Uh, I was going to try to stick it through till November. Um, and uh, maybe I might put in a break still for November, even though the Contender Series will be going on a hiatus and coming back. Uh, but yeah, man, um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, I'm very grateful. Very grateful to be here. Very grateful to be working. So don't don't get it twisted, man. I just... Uh, Got to get better at managing this stuff, um, as per my voice. Uh, we got to learn how to say no uh, and just, you know, keep things short. So we're going to practice with this podcast. Um, now the thank you and the disclaimer is out. We had uh, Dana White Contender Series, as I mentioned, did go down, number 31. All I wrote here was Thick Willie and Brad T., uh, of course, he, uh, you know Brad Tastrick, who I've had on this podcast. He's got his own podcast there. Those, those crazy guys, the MMA analysis, they tend to do their own nicknames, and uh, I got to give him credit, man, and, and mail him, you know, ten cents for royalties here. Uh, Thick Willie for William Knight might be my favorite nickname ever. Um, <laughs> we have to go into why, but it's just just awesome. Uh, glad to see that guy uh, get a contract. Um, Got my grading the winners article if you want to see really more my thoughts every week as far as what's next, what we saw, and uh, you know the winner grade. Um, uh, yeah, then uh, UFC and ESPN plus thirty three, the last fight that you know we broke down on here a card. We went eight and two overall in picks, so you know I think a lot of people catched their degenerate parlays, which was always nice. Um. It's weird, like two and one or three and one in straight plays. I, I think two and one, but like it, it, no, because like there was a cancellation. Of course, another light heavyweight fight, the under for uh, cute Laba and Ankalaev. We didn't really get to see the light of day. Rakage by decision though, and that over both cashed, which was nice. And uh, mag mag round three in the mist. Um, zero oh and two on my little bias straight plays. Um, I didn't recommend them to you, but. Uh, I'm always honest to you guys, better or worse, for what I play, and uh, I biasly played them. Patola, despite picking Kasanganai and Whitmer, as uh, both those fights were on my avoid list. But, uh, you know, despite going 0 2 there on the personal one, still did okay, so that was nice. Thank you guys for checking out the last episode, I should say, which wasn't a breakdown show. It was actually a. It wasn't a top five show either, it was an interview show, and I plan on doing more and speaking to more people. Uh, the industry, whether they are a fellow analyst like Tommy or um, uh, writers uh, that I've wanted to speak to, like uh, Spencer Kite. Shout out to Spence. Um, so I won't be bringing you guys more of those, but this was a fun conversation with Tommy Elliott. Uh, you know him better on Twitter, at Moy underscore Cowboy, uh, Fight Site contributor. And um, yeah, just to pick his brain uh, about judo and jujitsu and unique guard systems in MMA, I thought it was a very a good conversation. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed it. 
Uh, thank you for those of you who shared it, liked the video, and continue to subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, where this will be uploaded uh, probably by Friday night. Um, Daniel Tom MMA. I got to change it to Dan Tom MMA. The guys at Line Movement are getting on me about that. Uh, rightfully so. It's just, I don't know why I did, did it that way. <clears throat> so thank you guys for subscribing. I apologize for bitching about the subscriber count. It just... You got to whore yourself, and I'm not really good at it, um, clearly. Uh, and uh, I'm not good at playing all those reindeer games. Um, <clears throat> shout out to, uh, speaking of people cashing, shout out to my man Tony C. I'm not going to brutalize your last name, and I don't want to, for privacy reasons too, because again, just like um, just like old Bill, who I, that's not his real name, but uh, I, I get a lot of people uh especially the last year last year or two year and a half i would say um you know people share their plays what they do whether it's opinions or they want to you know uh, friendly br fr friendly uh brag which is totally cool with me by the way no judgment there good on you I, I say the same to them in private um whatever the case is uh the point is without you know giving these people away um they bet way and Again, folks, I'm really honest. Uh, I, I bet like a nine-year-old with an allowance. So it's not easy. It's very easy to bet more than me. But I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, they bet more than, I, I would say, your average better. And um, that's another reason why I kind of stress myself more than I probably need to to make sure I'm bringing a good product to market even if I'm not betting heavily or when I am betting, my betting heavy is not heavy at all. Because there are people who actually do bet big money that listen to this thing. God knows why, but thank you guys for doing so. Uh, the point is I do know that they do, and I want to give them the best reference point. I'm never telling anybody where to empty their bank account, but I want to give them the best reference point possible. So, A, that's why I kind of stress myself every week with this thing. And B, the positive point, the payoff for me, a genuine payoff, um, has actually nothing to do with money, and, and, and a lot of these people are kind enough to tip, and, da, 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 and that's fine, and you guys don't have to. You've, you've done enough. Thank you. The point is, it, it's genuinely, I, I'm sincerely swearing my mother, it makes me happy, like knowing I'm helping a lot of you guys cash out there. So even if I have a bad week, you know, MMA-wise or not, regardless, both, like, knowing that I'm helping a lot of you guys score, like, it genuinely makes me happy. So thank you guys for sharing. Thank you guys for listening. Sincerely, it, it means a lot. All right, um, uh, last question and shout, and we'll be on to the breakdown. Comes from a man, uh, Yusuf MMA, at MMA underscore Yusuf, Y-U-S-U-F. Uh, he DMs me at Dan Tom MMA. You can DM me there. <clears throat> uh, DM the podcast at the PYN podcast on all social platforms. I don't spam your feed. Uh, so your follow means a lot and doesn't take a lot out of you. In other words, it's very appreciated and an entry point to message me until I finally get my headset on what I want for a uh, dedicated email for the show. Cause I've got like seven emails. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Still waking up there. Gotta get it all. Damn, that's a little TMI. Thanks. The podcast is. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm reading his reply. Jesus. Uh, if it is on the screen, Burgundy will read it. I'm Ron Burgundy. Dan, I have two questions for you. Says Yusuf. One, you're very technical when breaking down MMA. How did you get to this level? I don't have a huge understanding and want to learn. Um, thank you for one. I'm not really good at compliments, so let me say. I don't know what level you think I'm at. Um, there are many better than me, uh, you know, um, and I tend to reference them on this show and their shows a lot. Uh, but and I'll probably reference some some now. But um, it, you know, people ask me this is a very general question, and honestly, it's hard because it's like there are people who uh, break down MMA very well without having a, having having done it or fought. Um, I'm not of the school, never have been, where uh, I don't want to say it's an elitist mentality because it's, you know, it's earning your freaking stripes, which should be appreciated in all walks of life, especially in something that's character building at its base, like martial arts, something so dear to me. 
So in no way do I uh, not get um, where that's coming from, or do I, you know, put my nose at it in return. I'm not. I don't fight fire with fire in that sense. I I, I live life more in the middle, in that gray zone, but with a with a purpose, not for riding the fence purposes. Because I've seen people that I just immensely respect, write, um, even teach. A lot of the best teachers were bad fighters, right? I think like people like you know, um, I, I don't know John Kavanaugh, uh, but I, I uh, you know I know he ended up tr you know training uh, with a coach of mine, Robert Follis, kind of crossing paths, and both those guys um, were given a lot of credit especially rightfully so in Fallis's case for his, his body of work. But both those guys, I think, were like negative fighters, you know, like your boy here <laughs> who didn't even do it pro. Um, but like, and sometimes those are the best teachers, though. It's weird, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's just kind of how it is. Um, a lot of my best coaches weren't, weren't great fighters or maybe they didn't even fight professionally. Um, so you got to be careful with that. Uh, a lot of great writers are, are the same way. Um, I credit mine, however, to doing it, but not in a, again, uh, you know, a nose up in the air way because the attachment to that, I don't know if it's a caveat, but it's the end of the sentence if I allow myself to finish it, which is I did it. I did it a lot, but I, I got beat up a lot. I got beat up a lot, a lot of phases in my life, a lot of different places in the United States from New York and Marcellos to the Shaolin Temple in China. I was lucky enough to train under guys like Drysdale, and, and I, I was very lucky to where I was as far as martial arts hotbeds, where I moved to and what I sought out in life and traveled to. Um, that's not everybody's case, man. Not everybody's knows that, can do that, and, you know, it wasn't easy. I, 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 I you know, uh, but I also am aware that I'm, you know, I'm very, I'm very lucky and I'm very grateful um, that being said, I've also took those opportunities, which I was lucky and grateful for. And I, just, I got beat up a lot. And that's kind of not the best way to learn, but when you're not athletic and not very good, um, I was able to parlay that into, okay, well, maybe I won't make a living of it. Maybe I won't even be that successful when I compete. But I'm, I'm getting valuable lessons here. I'm staying in shape. I'm happy. I'm healthy. And next thing you know, I was able to parlay this into uh, something. So I'm getting too long-winded here, but... Um, just get out there and learn, man. Uh, even the people, you know, who have just done limited jujitsu classes or some boxing classes um, still offer a, 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 a ton for people like even myself. So it, it just depends on where you are and what kind of person you are. What's your wiring? What's your passion? If that's your passion, follow it, my friend. Um, two, secondly, I'm a fan of how Technical Wonder Boy is as a striker. Are there any fighters that are calm and technical like his style or i can find in another sport maybe kickboxing wonder boy came from a similar background to me in the sense of sport karate kempo karate so i'm a big fan of wonder boy too however i'm going to deflect this question um i'm going to deflect this question to um at i'm not sure if he's listening to this but if anyone from the fight site is uh Whisper in his ear, Ryan Wagner, at Ryan A. Wag MMA, who I've had on this program before. I recently just listened to an awesome ep episode of his Eight Limbs Muay Thai podcast on the Fight Site podcast feed. I suggest you subscribe to and follow the fight-site.com. And uh, he did a Chinese kickboxing episode, which was awesome. And obviously Chinese kickboxing is not Kempo Karate, which is Japanese-based. Um, but the point is, he's got a, a, a wealth of knowledge as far as kickboxers, uh, strikers, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, but you, you want in the USC even, and, and that's really, that's, that's really tough. Um, I see a lot of guys get compared to Wonder Boy and I don't, I, I don't necessarily agree. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really tough because Wonder Boy really, you know, incorporates a lot of boxing, uh, intercepting punches. Um, and he does it in a much more, uh, emphatic way than even a guy like I, I like like Dominic Cruz. You know, they both have that Muhammad Ali kind of tie into their style. Although they're both different stylists, I wouldn't compare Dominic Cruz for your question. You know, if you're if you're asking, obviously, but it, so it's, it, it's a hard one to answer because also I'm I'm just a karate. Nut. I'm not going to just compare all karate guys. 
like Lyoto Machida is a Shotokan guy, and Shotokan, you're going to see, is going to a lower, heavier stance, um, much more linear, uh, as opposed to the lateral. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's really tough to find comparisons to Wonder Boy, in my opinion. But anyone else, feel free to hit me. I just, for that, I think of Ryan Wagner MMA. Sorry for that. That was a little longer than I thought. We're going to jump to 16 minutes. Breakdown, UFC on ESPN plus 34. Overeem versus Sakai, UFC fighting at 176. Hashtag UFC Vegas 9. You bet your ass I want to stay logged in. Uh, headline by Alistair Overeem, minus 155. Augusto Sakai, plus 135. Um, main card breakdown in detail. Of course, as per usual, up at MMAJunkie.com. Shout-outs to Abby Subban for those videos. And check out that uh, Legends segment coming out with... Uh, Burt Watson, whose first guest is Chael Sonnen, coming out this week on MMAJunkie.com. Um, and while I'm plugging junkie colleagues, want to gorgeous Georgian goes are way too kind on their shouts and want to thank them for their shout on Junkie Radio. If you want to hear more of them, so then you can do so like I did and subscribe for a very cheap amount on their Patreon. Uh, but, yeah, for the uh, in-depths, go over there. Um, if you want some video in-depths, me and uh, Daniel Levy over the Line Movement MMA betting show at line underscore movement uh, at line movement on YouTube. Subscribe there. Um, check it out. Uh, we also talk this match back and forth. And, um, you know, I don't want to speak for Dan Levy, but you know, he definitely, you know, has his own process and we stick to our own processes. We see what we come up. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't. Uh, and uh, even though we came across. Uh, across things in a different way as we always do because we have different processes I, I dare say um we both came into this leaning over him and uh he reserved his right to change his pick so maybe he did and i didn't listen to his show uh, by the way shout out to him and Shaq over there at half the battle but he ended up leaning towards sakai and uh i did the same with my own study um as i say in my breakdown over a junkie as well I, I came in leaning toward the ream you know me guys i'm a big over ream fan this is the spot where I usually play him, and I don't blame you for playing him. We'll get to as far as the line movement and where the value is now at. But with Sakai opening at initially plus 230, even then I still uh, was leaning toward the ream. And I'm, you know, a guy who's like, oh, everybody forgets about it. You know, it's clinch, it's underrated wrestling, and ground a pound. Oh, let him get bet down to near even dog odds, and that, that's where I usually bet the ream and, and do pretty well in like the server gay Pavlovich standards, right? <clears throat> However, um, uh, some coffee. as I look at it, not only has Sakai never been stopped or submitted, which sadly can be enough at heavyweight to beat a guy like Overeem, who's been knocked out 17, 16 times or something, uh, you know, dropped or stopped in 10 out of his last 17 fights. That's an ultimate swing that doesn't really blame, you know, anybody playing Sakai or picking him at the very least. But Sakai's actually pretty decent in the clinch offensively and defensively. His pace is actually really surprising. It consistently raises through the rounds. And as I brought up in previous breakdowns, don't judge a book by his cover because not only does the guy actually move well on his feet, uh, he's been striking for a minute since he was 14 Muay Thai. You know, does feints, stance shifts, combinations, can counter off the back foot. You know, by heavyweight standards, but still, he's he's doing these things or attempting them and doing them to with, with moderation of success. And um, the dude's like a competitive runner. Like you go to his Instagram and like one, it was good, which explains the deceptive counter wrestling uh, and smarts in the clinch and cage wrestling. He's been doing camps on and off at American Top Team, doing traveling there for about five years and about five plus years according to his Instagram, but doing competitive running now. You know. I don't know what the you know how competitive it is if you know there's a heavyweight division of it or you know, he's getting the participation medal because everyone in the pictures with them are clearly smaller than Sakai. But props to him, man. You know he's you know that that may take a effect on his knees. Certainly a man of that size later in life, but he's still only 29, which is a baby for a heavyweight. And um, dude's got a big head. He's seldomly rocked or stifled. Um, <clears throat> seems to know what he's doing on the ground. Yeah, he stalled a bit and did the cage grab against Blagoy. Like, uh, even off. Uh, but, <clears throat> but you know, 
uh, even off is better than he looks and gets credit for. You guys know that. I, I picked and probably played even off there. <clears throat> um, so, and that even off's no slouch, man. Sambo champ. Uh, and, you know, they're fighting at a really high pace. Um, and those takedowns came at the end of the round, so I, maybe I don't blame the guy for trying to get up. He's just like, let me just ride this out instead of giving a front headlock choke or, you know, something stupid at the end of the round. Um, and he may have still won those that round on judges' scorecards anyways, right? So I don't know how much you want to condemn. <clears throat> um, sorry, if you hear something, the dog's uh, wrestling around in the back. How much you want to condemn him for that? Um, so... I, but yeah, so uh, pace overall, I'm actually not too worried if it goes the late rounds. I feel like it's going to end around round three. Um, hard to place a bet on an over or under because it could just be over really fast. It's heavyweight, it's overeem, and I am picking Augusto Sakai. Um, just think he's got multiple paths to victory uh, as far as decision or knockout. And uh, yeah, I, I haven't liked Overeem's entries. You know, he beat Walt Harris, but the reason, aside from the obvious admitted bias that we all had for Walt, was that I didn't like Overeem's entries uh, in the Jarzinho Rosenstruck fight. Um, I didn't like, you know, how they were looking. Despite you know, shout out to Elevation Fight Team, he is improving in many areas. There, he still got it. Um, but you know, and the takedowns and the Walt Harris came off of kind of sloppy scrambles, right, for the most part. Um, and the Jarzinho Rosenstruck fight, he doesn't shoot enough for my liking, anyways. And even though he is arguably on the way to winning that decision. He gets knocked out and caught at the end, right? Because, you know, even his cardio was, was starting to lack. Another reason why I'm not exactly worried about Sakai getting taken advantage of in the late rounds. where Or in the Ninganu fight where he just kind of has one half-hearted clinch attempt, doesn't like what he feels, and then falls apart shortly after. So we've seen late fall-aparts and we've seen early fall-aparts from failed takedowns. So that's, you know, that's the thing. And Sakai, if you look... Earlier in his career, he's actually doing really smart stuff like single leg getups. You know, Dan Tom is a big fan of that. So um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. You know, you can say Sakai's had trouble with veteran strikers who can stick and move, and the record would argue those were his toughest fights. Um, and that could happen here. Um, good luck to you if you're betting over him because that's where the value is now that he's been bet down to minus 140 to minus 155 range where he is now. Um, I played Sakai. Uh, up higher I think I got him at like minus or plus 165 and even that was like eh, that seemed a little too too low it's plus money at heavyweight so you can't argue with it but I would say plus 150 or higher is where you know that's more the Sakai range I would like to see personally uh, for anybody you know placing degenerate wagers whereas right now even at favorite odds I think it's over him so uh, my pick is Sakai. Um, betters beware there. Uh, I will be honest. Again, I did I did sprinkle earlier in the week, um, and I got uh, at a higher number, not a lot higher number. I didn't I didn't get in early, but you know, is what it is. Alonzo Menafield minus one thirty five. Ovens Saint Pru. OS Tennessee 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 Tennessee. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to see what St. Pierre looked like on the scales. Uh, I'm pretty sure he made weight. Um, Jesus. 500 plus pounds of the scale, yeah. Ooh, sorry. I you know this does not make for good podcasting as I they see me scrolling, riding, scrolling. Uh, sorry, I should just click on the post where it's listed, damn. Instead of sc- yeah, 205.5. Wow, he took the point five, didn't he? Um, we'll see. Uh, it's my co-host Dan on the Line Movement MMA Betting Show brought up there are some interesting intangibles with the turnaround of weight cuts that I don't blame anybody for scaring uh, off a St. Prue bet. At the end of the day, all the intangibles to on paper. I'm siding with a veteran here. It's kind of been one of the safer trends when having to flip the coin, although I just did inside with a veteran in the previous fight. Um, and, you know, I just think St. Prue's got him outgunned everywhere. And I don't, I don't you know... Menafield doesn't have the sample size yet to where, oh, he's going to take advantage of St. Prue gassing late with his process, which Menafield, to his credit, does have a better, albeit more limited process because St. Prue doesn't fight with this process. He just kind of does stuff. And he's athletic and powerful, and he's got um, some smarts and some uh, certain key positions that keeps him above water. 
So I'm taking St. Peru again. Um, I bet him. Um, yeah, I did. What the heck? I don't know why he's not on my sheet here. Um, let me make sure I bet him. I, I lose track so easily, folks. I kind of hope I didn't because I think, I, you know, yeah, I did plus 110. I was going to say because um, he's plus 115 now. I'll, I'll take him now. Nope. I already bet him it was plus 110. Um, yeah, I'm going to take Ovin St. Peru again. You guys kind of you know, know my feels there. If he gets knocked out. Would it be surprised, but at the same time, it's kind of one of those fights where you want him to get rocked because then Menafield is going to lose his gas tank and then St. Peru will have his way in the comeback. Um, who knows where the next fight's going to go? Michelle Pajeda, minus 115, and Zalim Imadayev. Um, Imadayev, I think, hit the scales, but let's see if it's a fight day cancellation or not. Um, as a, if you've listened, shout out to another junkie colleagues, MMA Roadshow, Kenny and John there. Um, Guys as well worth supporting, uh, but on their uh, program, uh, they were talking about you know they've been talking about fighters the media day being the giveaway for the COVID scares. They've been pretty spot on, which scares me. Um, it scared me because they were the one that called the St. Pru fight kind of being off. They didn't say it, of course, but they said don't be surprised if it happens. Um, and uh, Imadayev, I believe, was someone they were mentioning for that as well. Um, this is a fight where you take the plus money, but it's so close and unpredictable. The line is kind of predictably and justifiably near even odds with minus numbers next to both men's name. I took Michelle Pajeda uh, for wrestling. And Madaev, it's funny, like, he's really good with a certain range of wrestling. Like, he can hit takedowns, but he can't hold a guy down. He can get taken down by almost anybody, but to his credit, he's really good at getting up. So the going down and getting up part, he's really good at. He just can't control... Or uh, he can't dictate what happens on the feet or on the floor. Mid-range, he'll, he'll fight his ass off. However, Pajeda, even though he is goofy as hell, and he's not specific, like, oh, I've got like a black belt in jiu-jitsu, or I wrestle here, it just says champion of wrestling, champion of jiu-jitsu, and champion of karate. But to his credit, that, those are the skill sets that he does show. Um, and his wrestling does actually look pretty damn good. Aside from just being a big guy, like he's doing good level changes and and what not there, at least, you know, from my grade. I'm no, uh, I'm no Ed Gallo. Shouts to Ed. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, um, I think I'll take Pajeda uh, to outpoint if he can't get the knockout. And Medaya showed he can be knocked out. pajeda has been knocked out too, but that was by Dusko at middleweight, who actually has really good boxing. Um, not that Emadayev doesn't. Emadayev has a good check left hook. That's going to be the shot to look out for from him um brownie leave your brother alone he has a, we're trying to record a pipe good boy a smelly stink man sorry the kids the kids here um relax no sorry i'm yelling into the mic brownie stop um so yeah next fight brian kelleher minus 230 uh Kevin Navidad, plus 190, Veliz Navidad. That guy must be so sick of hearing that song, right? Stop fucking singing it, motherfuckers. I'm going to be a fighter now. Uh, <laughs> and he might not even fight because he's replacing, I forget who, before Brian Kelleher has been having a whole jump of opponents. And now you got Ray Rodriguez. Shouts to Ray Rodriguez. Um, that guy definitely deserves a shot if he's to get it. Uh, may wait as a replacement. So it'll either be Brian Kelleher versus Kevin Navidad. Uh, who I haven't seen, but looks like he can handle himself. Nine and one, impressive record. Um, never been submitted, I believe. So that's something to look for. Whereas Brian Kelleher, uh, you know, Brian Kelleher, I think he's going to want to look for a ground fight against Navidad and test him there, especially with being in a stand-up war not too long ago um, and being on the wrong end of it. Right? Didn't Kelleher get uh, knocked out? Uh, but if he comes in with that game plan, it's dangerous if he gets the last-minute switch against Ray Rodriguez, who is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, I believe. And he is very strong in the scramble, so then it becomes a very interesting fight. Um, so I'm more interested if it becomes a Ray Rodriguez fight, to be honest. But both guys look like they deserve to be here. Um, no, he didn't get knocked out. He got the knockout, but he did lose his stamina at UFC 250 in June. Yeah, that's busy for Kelleher. Let's see. Let's see how that holds up for him. I like Brian Boom, so, you know, part of me is always rooting for him, too. But uh, 
I'll be rooting for Ray Rodriguez. Let's just say if uh, if that gets switched, Tiago Moises uh, next fight uh, minus one fifty. Jalen Turner plus one. Mister Turner, Mister Turner. Uh, I just missed the boat at plus one sixty. I had a really tough time deciding this fight, and it was one of those late night picks because we had to get our picks in. We had to pick for the whole card, so I didn't really get a whole lot of time. And I didn't feel good about it, and I ended up picking Tiago Moises. It's because he's one of those guys where it was like, initially when I had to just put the pick in, right? So he's one of those guys where it's like, I don't, I have a bad read on, but like he gets the hype from everybody, and he wins more often than not. So, so ah, fuck, I hate picking against those guys. I feel like I'm missing something, you know? You're just like, like, like you know, the stupid kid in class. Like, I don't want to out myself. Just gonna see what the other person says and hope nobody notices. Uh, you know, and but then when I went to look at it further, I'm like, wait a minute, this motherfucker loses to Southpaws. The only South White beat was Michael Johnson, but he was getting tagged up by Michael Johnson. And as we know, when Michael Johnson fights, he's winning until he loses. He is that fighter and it's by submission. Um, and you know, just you know, low percentage submissions where you don't want to split hairs. But Jesus Christ, Johnson's been in the UFC long enough. You can if you want to be critical. And I like Michael Johnson. Big fan of Michael Johnson. Big friend of MMA Junkie Radio. Michael Johnson. Michael Johnson cashed a lot of underdog bets for me. Michael Johnson. I no disrespect, but you know, it, he's got plenty of chances to uh, to to you know to get out of some of these spots that he's gotten himself into. Brownie, stop it. Relax. Chew your bone. Um, sorry, I'm going to be a bad cop. Um, so, we'll, 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 you know, uh, you know, even going back to, you know, Robert Watley in LFA, like, I don't think he does well against Southpaws. Now, Turner is a Southpaw, but he's not like, if you want to be, you know, stereotypical or he's actually like an explosive like no he can be but he's his pace actually goes throughout the rounds he keeps really good pace and keeps in good condition despite being and you know me i'm usually like like who is that one guy who uh was the favorite and got beat by ronnie lawrence but if the other guy won i'm like oh great another big another big long Long dude cut into bantamweight who should be a 45 or like andre when it looks like i'm picking on all these guys and you would think that um, you know Montel J Jackson. Um, and you think that uh, <clears throat> Jalen Turner's another one, but no, man, the guy seems to make the weight fine. Um, and keep himself in good shape. His pace, even by the numbers, always grows. His takedown defense isn't the best because of his frame, but the guy's quietly a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu brown belt, which might be why he's never been submitted. And when you look at you know Callum Potter, who's you know a, a legit submission guy, um was giving him similar looks as far as leg looks and things that we saw got Michael Johnson and we saw Moises. He doesn't go to a lot, by the way. That's very rare Moises goes to those as far as an MMA goes. He's more of a IBJJF style positional player. Um, he'll just randomly do that kind of stuff, like guillotine Darius, which was really weird. Um, but, um, but yeah, like... Turner actually like does like the proper things. Like if you look at his defense for the omoplata, leg lock, and guard stuff, like all the things that happen, like he's very I liked it a lot. I liked what I saw from him. Um and uh yeah, I'm just not sold on Tiago Moises, man. I just I just don't get it. He he fights at a way too low of a low of a pace, you know, for his weight class, for his experience and his skill level. He's not in a heavier weight class like a Belfort or Overeem. He's not as skilled or as powerful as those guys to be landing 7 to 14 strikes around and having to depend on that, accompanied with his other skills to convince judges. Um, I'm actually more convinced he could get a knockout on Turner with Turner's chin. You know, obviously he suffered some bad knockouts. That looks that looks suspect, but he's a young guy. Let's not bury sand on his grave yet. Um, and especially in a matchup like this where... I'm not sure that's going to happen. Um, and if anything about getting rocked, um, Moises is wrestling, which is underrated. Um, it looks like to be getting better, which should be an American top team, seems to save him because the guy's even been rocked by jabs. Like, you look at Demir, is Magulov. Is Magulov? I don't know, man. Look in the mirror. Uh, he got dropped by a jab. And, um, sorry, Brownie's chewing on my bedpost, so that's what you hear in the background. 
So, you know, the chin thing could go both ways here, but whether it's by knockout or by decision, um, I think Turner um, gets it here. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I ended up, I ended up playing him. And, uh, and, and, and uh, again, shout out to, uh, to my co-host Dan there. Um, I may or may not have, and, you know, not trying to convince each other either way. We each make up our own minds. Don't get me wrong. But I may or may not have helped influence him on the main event. And uh, he, uh, I'll, I'll give him credit for, for influencing, helping influence me on the, uh, or at least our conversation, I should say. It definitely influenced, uh, go check it out at Lime Moment. You could see us kind of hash it out. So it's not just, not just pulling it out and, you know, um, freaking, uh, what's, what's it called? Um raw rawing you know uh, the same side like the, we actually parse it out on the show pretty well like i'm trying to do for you guys here and um i just feel like you know jylan turner's a live dog even at plus 130 but as the line creeps down i don't think it's the situation where it's like he, he moises doesn't again command the same respect to over him again for another comparison for a different reason um where I, i'll say you know if turner even goes down to plus 110 and you're you get Moises at even money. I'm still not going to be like, oh, the value's on Moises, because I, I just don't trust Moises, man. I don't trust him. So I officially changed my pick over with Junkie and uh, play Turner at plus 140. So good luck if you're on him. Um, Bartosz Fabinski, minus 165. Andre Muniz, plus 145. More money coming on on Fabinski. I thought this would go the other way, especially after this week slash weigh-ins. This was a fight where I was like, wait a minute. Minas keeps being a dog where he shouldn't be from contender series to other places. I think because he's been knocked out. Like Turner, he got knocked out bad in some some spots early in his career. But Munez, like Turner, is young in his career, man. You got to be careful about judging him. And I broke down the, 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 the relevant knockdown that actually came within like five years ago, within the last five years. I think they all were like over a while ago. And, like, he's going over to Russia, I think, facing, like, a decent guy. And I forget what the shot was, but it was, like, a really good shot that would put someone out. You know what I'm saying? Uh, whereas Fabinski, not, he gets all TKOs, but they're, like, ground and pound attritional TKOs, folks. He's actually a small middleweight, um, Fabinski is. Uh, whereas Munez is a big middleweight. Um, I would have told you this before fight week. However, sorry, my voice is, like, going. Fabinski himself uh, posts a picture of them together. And Munez looks huge there in the hallway. He looks huge, massive over him. And I'm like, well, let's see if, you know, well, I don't know what their training is like. I know Fabinski's training at the WCA gym over in Poland with uh, Jan. But he's always training with wrestling guys. He's never in the gi. He's never training with jiu-jitsu guys. I never see Brazilians. It's always wrestling or MMA guys. Like, he doesn't change his style, which is fine. And he may be good enough to survive and burn out Munez here. Um, Munez is kind of a burst fighter in his own way, even though he's a grappler. But, I like I said before, he's a submission machine, and his cardio and wrestling and scrambling is a lot better than you think. Because he'll go for submissions, he'll chain them, but he'll use it to get the top position or advantageous positions where he'll get a takedown and then get top position stall from top position or get to your back and stall from there if he can't finish you and he'll at least bank around. We all know the feeling, right? We bet on a fighter and he takes the back and we're like, thank God, either submit him or just hold around. And there's a little bit of reprieve, relief, right? Right? Um, and I think Munez is that, especially in anything north of plus 130 uh, or 140. So uh, I played him at plus 140. Um, he made weight fine. Uh, and looks to be in the best shape ever, actually, that I've seen him come in on the scale, which says something. Maybe he was, you know, upset at himself for that little uh, pit of the fight where he gassed out but was able to recover and win against Antonio Arroyo. Um, but, yeah, man, we've seen Munez eat up wrestlers before who are supposed to beat him. So um, I'll take him against Fabinski here. Um, striking southpaw who's a second-degree jiu-jitsu black belt, folks. Not just a, a black belt, second degree, okay? There's a reason why I'm impressed with his jiu-jitsu. So I got Andre Munez here. Next fight, uh, Viviana Araujo, minus 175, versus Montana De La Rosa, plus 155. Um, 
I did not do deep study on this fight. I kind of watched their last fights in passing. Uh, I intentionally took Araujo here. I, I agree with the line. Um, props to you for taking shots either way. I think the point of entry is low enough if you're that confident in Araujo. I am not. I may put her in something degenerate on fight day. We'll see where the line goes. But um, I feel like Araujo has to kind of uh, really have a have a bad fight and play into her. Again, she's more of a burst fighting a burst fighting Brazilian as well, right? She'll kind of have pits of the fight where she'll take to recover. Hey, that's not a knock. One of the best fighters of all time, Jose Aldo, uh, fought in bursts. If you watched him carefully and even looked at the numbers, which correspond to that. Um, they do it in their own ways. And Viviato Ujo did it in more obvious ways, unfortunate to her. It's cost her before. Um, so she's going to have to do that, in my opinion. And De La Rosa is going to have to fight the perfect fight, uh, in my opinion, to steal some scorecards. Because she's the more consistent fighter, the more consistent process. Her and Mark, it's funny, have a similar style in the sense of their boxing jiu-jitsu people. <laughs> a f female flyweight, um, it's a really reliable process. Uh, not necessarily for De La Rosa, uh, but like as far as in general, it's a good thing to build off of. Um, as my dog just left the room. Hopefully she doesn't start crying. And... Um, and whereas at male flyweight, it's not nearly enough and way too shallow of a skill pairing, um, as we've seen. No offense, no shots. And I'm a fan of De La Rosa, not just in a weird Danton way. Yeah, uh, Easy Dan, easy, stay on target. We're all fans, right? Easy Dan, easy. That's a mother. Uh, just saying she's an attractive lady. They're both attractive. Uh, but um, So I'd love to see her do well, uh, but I'm going to pick out Ujo here. She's definitely the, I think, the more harder hitter. Um, although De La Rosa, like you know, got a knockdown, or, I believe, in her last fight, like her first one. So we'll see if her improvements continue to go there. Uh, but I'm gonna take out of Ujo. Um, next fight, uh, Alexander Romanov, minus 145, got down to minus 140, opened at a minus 130 over uh, Rod Marcos Rogerio de Lima, a.k.a. Florida, because he looks like Florida. Welcome to my house. We don't even know. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome to my house. Uh, and he jumps into submissions. That's all Marcos Rogerio de Lima does. This guy's an auto fade for me. If you guys have been listening to the podcast, you know that. Um, he's knockout or bust. And then he randomly will dust out, like, a decision measured win against, like, Weezerick. I think that was him, like, not, you know, being happier at heavyweight for the first time and facing a guy who really turned out to be a, a Stefan Struve fraud and was more of a, what was he, was he, like, part of, like, like neo-Nazi, like, soccer hooligan crowds or something he was associated with? Like, he had more ties to that to being a fighter at the end of the day, so I, I don't know how much you want to weigh in on, on that victory. Um, for being his most impressive one, but the guy literally, even in fights he's winning, will like find his way into submissions. Um, so against a guy who's actually got a bunch of wins by TKO and submission, and will take the back or look for submissions from top side, will even just throw a throw him in, forearm into your throat. Um, Alexander Romanov, and I, I know what you're thinking. He, he's he's a, he's a he's a jiggly guy, but like Sakai, man, you can't. You got to be careful about judging these guys. They're not, you know, um, is, you know, Roy Nelson's much older now. So, but you know, even younger Roy Nelson would prove, you know, prove you different. But no, this guy is really legit. Even though he's listed as a sumo fighter, he's fought poor competition in what are some comical, terrible fights, ladies and gentlemen. By the way, like, hey, Brownie, stop, stop it. By the way, what's up with guys named Mertzelayev? Like, do refs have a problem with stopping fights? They just let him take beatings? Because, like, the guy, like, ha had, like, nine lives given to him in his fight uh, against Romanov, which was really funny. Uh, but Romanov looks to be coming in better shape, improving each time, uh, on you know, through the regional fights that I saw of his. Uh, of course, he fought guys like, uh, who was it? Uh, if you're playing seven degrees of separation, you always got to use Yuri Grabenko, right? <laughs> Uh, pour one out for that guy. And Danny, he's not dead. Well, you know what I mean. Um, Brownie, stop it. Sorry, folks, for yelling into the mic. Um, but yeah, like, uh, it's the dude listed as a sumo fighter, but he's actually got, like, 
I know MMA Moldovan accolades. Who's he fighting? It's heavyweight, but he's got accolades there. More more so, he's got more on my bio sheet. He's got grappling accolades and competition accolades, submission grappling accolades, and it comes through in his fighting style. Like the guy will take it back. He knows how to float and use his weight really well. Like he's seldom falling over the front. Uh, whether he's riding or, tr or even taking a back. Like, the guy floats really well. Uh, he looks for wrists. Um, he can hit level-changing takedowns in the open. Uh, power doubles drive through, take guys down against the fence, work off singles, lift guys' legs in the air. Like, the guy the guy could fight, man. He's got some enthusiasm. He's got that intangible kind of it factor. He's a southpaw who slings hard tie kicks on the feet. So he's not going to be, hopefully, you know, this will be the best uh, heavyweight striker he's faced or tie fighter he's faced. But he loves Muay Thai. He's actually fought it before. That being said, even though he's undefeated, he has two knockout losses, both in kickboxing and as an amateur. That being said, those were upwards of nine years ago. Um, again, early in his career as a pro, uh, he looks really confident. hasn't shaken his confidence. Um, he looks pretty durable. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, uh, you know, durable, uh, southpaws who can wrestle and, and get some submissions. Like, dude, I'll bet this line all day against him. Uh, you know, it's a debuting heavyweight, uh, which is very dangerous out of principle, but out of principle, I, I cannot, I cannot not fade Marcos or Jerry DeLima at a point of entry against a capable fighter. So there's my logic. Take it or leave it. I played him. Um, at uh, 1.5. Uh, next fight, I didn't do study on this one. Hunter Azur minus 225, Cole Smith plus 185. Um, shouts out to those of you who played Hunter Azur, so I don't want to worry you here. I didn't do definite tape study. I just kind of thought Cole Smith, that, I've seen Cole Smith in person. The guy is a huge bantamweight. Uh, Hunter Azur is back at bantamweight where he should be. People in, in were listing him as featherweight. I don't know why. I know he fought one fight there, but he's, he's a bantamweight. Um, but Cole Smith's a really big one, bantamweight. Uh, can be opportunistic, you know, and, and maybe find that third-round finish or, or so like Kelleher did. I think it was in the third round or second. I could see Cole Smith doing the same thing. Uh, I don't like the turnaround. was essentially why I picked Cole Smith as the dog here for my junkie picks, even though it won't make it because it was a prelim. But I'm going to stick to that early pick here. Uh, I'm not confident. Um, I don't want to put it on my avoid list because there's probably a good reason why he's favored that much. And there's some people that I respect that are on Hunter. Uh, so whether it's dog or pass or whether you're on the chalk, I don't, I don't want to say that it's a void for that reason, but I'm, I'm going to take uh, Cole Smith. All right. How do we do on time? Not too ooh, worse than I thought. Jesus. All right. Recapping. Taking Augusto Sakai over Alistair Overeem. Taking Ovin St. Pru, Tennessee, over Alonzo Minifield. Taking Michelle Pajeda over Zelim Imedaev. Taking Brian Boom Kelleher over Kevin Navidad. Taking Mr. Turner, Jalen Turner, over Tiago Moises. Taking Andre Munez over Bartos Fabinski. Taking Viviana Araujo over Montana De La Rosa. Taking Alexander Romanoff over Welcome to Marcos. Rogerio Lima fall into submission. Uh, taking Cole Smith over Hunter Azur. Um, I didn't parlay anything. Didn't really take any props. Uh, don't have an organized avoid list. But I did play Sakai at plus 160, OSP at plus 115, Turner at plus 140, Romanoff at minus 140, and Munez at plus 140. A lot of straight shots in the barrel. Uh, loaded a six-shooter and fired five out. Good luck to you guys if you're playing that loaded of a game of Russian roulette. Good luck on your picks and plays. Um, and always, protect your neck.